ladies and gentlemen, envies and otherwise, it is my great pleasure, Adelaide community, to introduce our friend, your friend, my friend, the people's friend, Spoz. Hello, hello, hello. We got him, guys. We got him. <laughs> Trapped in a bell jar. That's right. Uh, gasping for air. Um, hi, hi, hi. So, for those who don't know, for the few who don't know, uh, who are you and what do you do? Um, okay, so I'm a uh, terrestrial-based uh, bipedal organism um, of simian origin, I think reasonably sentient. That's um, uh, in the soul system, in the local Virgo cluster. Um, long story short, um, yeah, so I'm a... Uh, <laughs> That's literally me, dude. Yeah, I mean, don't we all? Um, so yeah, I'm a photojournalist for the Adelaide music scene. It's not really a central authority. It's like an amorphous consciousness that is the Adelaide music scene. And I serve it as its willing uh, photographic host. The, the best summation I can think of is as David Attenborough is to the natural world... I'm the narrator for the Adelaide music scene. Perfect. Yeah, it's sort of, you know... That's uh, that's pretty immaculate, honestly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I could reach the age of... He's almost 100 now yeah, and be five. that wizard who does that thing. There's this guy in the Berlin club scene. He's like, he's in his 80s and stuff. He just looks like just this mad, wide-eyed wizard. And he goes to all, like, the Berlin, like, love parade raves. And... It would be good if I could be that guy in about, you know, 30, 40, 50, 90 years, however. Yeah, yes. However old I am. Yeah, it's a, it's a question. Yeah. That, we're going to ask a lot of questions today. That's yep, not true, one that's true. ever going to get an answer, though. Excuse me while I just age. eat a Dorito very meticulously while you are. This episode, is, this you episode of the Sundials podcast is proudly sponsored by Doritos. Mm. Get them. They're mm. good. If you, if you light them up correctly, it looks slightly translucent. He's right. It's a, a little factoid there for the, for the kids at home. Right. Well, I think in my recollection, the first time I met Spoz was, I feel like I saw you a little bit during, like, there must have been, like, Teenage Jones playing at, like, the Crown and Anchor one time. One like, of the many 50 shows yeah, they've done over the years. They were doing, like, that back then they were playing, like, every weekend. And I, I think I saw you at one of them. And then, like, I don't know, that must have been, like, around the time of COVID. And then... Yeah, the, the peak t um, Teenage Jones period was mostly all through of 2019. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, I don't know, there was just like some, I don't know when, how long afterwards this was, but there was like a show at like the Golden Waddle. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and at that point in time, I just started going out by myself and I just, I think a... I remember the show just to use the whole, um, Spoz photographic memory here. Uh, there was a band called the one, but the, uh, the word one was just the, uh, the number one. Ah. And it was, uh. He's, I think he's goes by the name of Casio Oslo. He's also in the hip hop group Socrates, and he had that solo project where like he's got this baritone Barry White of hip hop kind of flow. Cool. And he's got the backing band. I can't remember where this backing band hailed from, but they're just like their crew around the scene who sort of uh, veer into the jazzy, but more the jazzy hip hop territory, and they're laying down this groove, and it was just. Just in that period where you could stand up, but you couldn't dance. Yeah. And, you know, baritone, hip-hop flow, and that groove. And I'm like, I'm just suffering internal bleeding from not dancing to that shit. It's like... Yeah, that was a weird window And it was them and uh, Kitten Kong and Mellow Yo. I guess that's what I must have been there for. Yeah. But that was... Yeah, that was, I was the just, one. I was just there, and I had a, a bunch of beer, and I had drank in the amount of beer that I... And you got your needed. first uh, your first inaugural uh, stupid photo Get that I took was. for the blog. I think it was a couple of photos. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But I, I just oh, had too I much the beer. Fingers. And I, I like, oh, no! Um, yeah. I'm just um, going to put it all over your furniture, so you just have that light film of orange dust everywhere it, it, you uh, really thought this through didn't we, you we clean the house we, especially as well so we're just going to get uh this doritos here are just going to be aerosol coated on the walls the floor the furniture it's like when you smoke indoors back in the 70s but with dorito dust it's good well, um, again not sponsored by doritos not sponsored oh sweet by doritos. this is the weirdest friend of the podcast uh, uh Emil has up. just rocked up to the house oh here we go here we go good morning <laughs> Awkwardly appearing uh, with uh, uh, Carlsberg. We're now sponsored who, by Carlsberg. Who actually, uh, again, this is almost like a reverse uh, sponsorship. Who the hell drinks Carlsberg? Like, willingly. Us now. They don't, they're currently, they're unavailable. The, the pilsners I like. 
Yeah, I mean, I've never got into Pilsner. The I've sundials? never understood the concept of Pilsner. It's like, it's the beer equivalent of a Pinot. <laughs> and I think it's maybe just the P. It, I, maybe because it is actual P. I guess like, so. just not to, you know, bounce from one to the other. You know, this is a, a great segue. I like this, yeah. Well, cheap <laughs> that's, piss. That's cheap piss, yes. I figured, um... I don't know, I drink, I'm an XPA man, and I was thinking about it, the XPAs... For a proper round meal, try Doritos. Try Doritos. And Pilsners. And don't try Pilsners. And don't pee for we're, a week. We're not sponsored by Pilsners anymore. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, we got XPAs for later. I feel yeah. like when it t- turns to five o'clock exactly, I'm going to start drinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, just about... a advance warning, because, um, yeah, this podcast is probably going to go for about an hour. Yeah, we're going to go for two and a half hours, Yeah, I think. Okay. I'm just going to go segue really badly here, but you, you probably need to shoot me the next question no, before fuck I it. really no, go off the rails. So that's cool, first of all, because I actually don't remember anything about that. Sh- that what you were just talking about. That From event. the photo, it looked like you didn't remember much. Yeah, yeah. and fucking hell that you remember that. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, it's um, it's literally a photographic memory. That's insane. As in, I take the photo and then I can actually remember yeah. it. Because there was about a seven-year period of my life when I, when it was legal for me to drink, going out before I got a camera. And I don't remember much of it. Oh, no. At least not going out. I don't remember much of that. And that was kind of what led into me getting a camera and shooting stuff. Yeah. Well, um... So, uh, okay. Uh, well, Emil has entered the room. Me, the party man. Just, just, so, just out of context, uh, Emil is just an outside of the camera um, um, presence in the room. This may affect may affect proceedings. He's, he's the boss of the Sundials podcast. He's the... Um, there's the slight malevolent air of mischief that could erupt. Mm, it's just got colder in this room now. Uh, uh, above any any uh, malevolent air of mischief that I may bring. But it's funny you mention that. As joke, I stroke my tiny beard, cackling in my mind. I have a, a kitten Kong sticker. Yeah. That I was handed that night that I still have, and I don't know where it came from. Yeah. But I that, guess that's why. That could be it. They're they're very rarely on the scene. Mm, yeah. I think they they have to wait until Matthew McConaughey actually releases another film. And then they have to wait until that's kind of gone through the cinemas and then they can play another show because that way Matthew McConaughey is in everyone's minds. And that way they can go, play Matthew McConaughey. Do they have a song called Matthew McConaughey? Yeah, it's like the act. I'm trying to guess what the lyric is. Hmm. It's just Matthew McConaughey yelled. That's cool. About for three minutes. It's a great, it's their best song. I, I can yeah. appreciate that. As a band with a song called Baby, where the lyric is just like, baby. I can another, appreciate it. Another Dorito enters the chat. Hell yes. And it swiftly leaves down spots or something. So how's this doing for the uh, the sound? Oh, don't you worry, Spots. ASMR episode. <laughs> Just another ASMR Dorito oh. brand. Mmm. Nummy. All right. Well, next question. How long have you been doing this, Spots? Okay, so this is uh, reasonably well-timed. Um... The blog in October last year celebrated 20 years. Wow. And this year, around about April, it's been 20 years of me taking photos. Cool. And also taking photos of live gigs, because pretty much the week I got the camera, in fact, the day I got the camera, I shot my first gig. So. Cool. Well, you know what that was? <laughs> so, I mean, <clears throat> thankfully it involves both a venue and bands that no longer exist. It was at the Proscenium, mm. which... Older viewers, if there are any older viewers for this podcast, hi everyone, hi everyone. Um, should have waved from my parents now, that's awkward. Um, <clears throat> they don't know where this place was anyway. But back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was this notorious haunt called uh, Proscenium. It was all on the alleyways between Hindley and the train station. Cool. And it was notoriously a gothic haunt, like just full blown gothic haunt and. The band that I shot primarily there was Circle Clan, who were kind of like, um, this may be a bit of a weird reference, but they most resembled a band called Pitch Shifter, which if you know Pitch Shifter, they're kind of like um, late 90s metal meets electronica, but not in the really cringeworthy kind of uh, new metal way, but more in the kind of UK driven gnashing guitars and just angst. And there was an Adelaide version of that called Circle Clan. And they were the first ish band I shot actually no that was on the Saturday the Friday is actually worse it was Enigma <laughs> that, yeah, my dude. first gig was Enigma that I shot nice on camera and the band was Your Motive 4 wow little factoid with cool spaz. there you go yeah that, I guess oh man so yeah 20 years 
20 years. 20 years. That's mad. Oh, that that opens up a whole other line of questions that I was trying to visualize that, so I'm kind of caught off guard now. But I could get into some of these questions. We have audience questions today, dear audience. audience. Questions. audience so questions. I have on my phone here. I wanted Michelle. to make a giant mobile phone to hold. but I Michelle, get hold these uh, Doritos for safety while you're um, pondering which questions to ask. Of course. Never give Spoz props, I think, is the lesson from this. It just feels like the natural sequel to the Spoz Today Tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yet yeah, nobody looked that up. I mean, somebody once showed me to the, um, somebody recently showed me that, and I finally got to see my own appearance. Yeah. Because okay. I vowed. I mean, I this I did today tonight about ten years ago, and I just never watched it myself, just so I didn't have to deal with the cringe of. I mean, it's not so much of me on camera. I'll be watching this later on, but it was the idea of watching me. On today tonight yeah that's great <laughs> it's just no that is a level you, you don't want to witness but if you're out there and you want to find it it's still online at least it was last year look up spoz today tonight i'm so going to regret saying that hell yes yeah i've seen that yeah it was uh, it was a bit cringe because it was like 2013 when they did it and it was like today tonight after a decade had finally discovered the concept of blogs yeah, that's, and, that um, is how it seems, actually. Yeah, so they're just really hyped about this new thing called blogs. And it's like, nah, the heyday had already just, like, it had dropped. And they they got me to round up uh, the people on the show because it was just a bunch of fashion bloggers who were, like, legitimately doing some serious influencer-type stuff. And then it was just me being filmed in the Exeter. Yeah. Just the little things like getting into gigs for free, you get the occasional free drink. And... <laughs> They wanted me to bring the laptop as well, so they could get some B-roll footage of me typing the blog, and it was so cringe. Yeah. So cringe. I was wondering about that. I was like, why are you on a computer? Yeah, they wanted me to bring it as a prop, and I did ask them to actually chase me with the cameras at the end, and I could slam a door in their faces like, nah, cool. sorry, we got to do another filming. I was like, oh, wish I could have done that. For music blogger Spoz Spozington, and yes, it's an alias, being a full-time music blogger means spending most nights at the pub. It's the dream of living like a, a rock musician without any of the major perks. Okay, so here's the first question from Rufus. If he were a tree, where would he be planted? Tree. I mean... I think the easiest answer to that is if I was a tree and I was planted anywhere... Um, you know that one random tree outside the, uh, outside the cranker? Yeah. Yes. Maybe plant a second tree. That is a good idea. That is watered only by stray dog by urine. By piss and beer. Yeah. Yeah, and little bits of broken glass. It's, Excellent. Uh, it would make the most luscious, um, jagged glass, uh, pineapples would, would spawn from this tree. Uh, there's no correlation between that and me as a person at all, but mostly just for the broken glass. But yeah, I reckon a, a tree outside... The cranker. That's actually probably. great. I would want to be that as well. Or like, if they finally take over for real, if they take over Roxy's next door as the official beer garden of the cranker, I would want to be a tree in there. Mm. That would be a pretty good place. Yeah. Is that is that some secret tea? I would go to the that place if it was a crown anchor. Yeah, I mean they had that thing where in 2019 they finally uh, set up a door between the band mm. room and Roxy's because so when cool. they had that whole Day of Clarity slash, I think it was Neon Dreams, I forget the name of a couple of festivals they had in 2019. Mm. We were kind of like, yeah, they opened up several rooms Block for party. it. party, yeah, that was so cool. And they haven't really used it since. I know, that was like pre-COVID maybe? Yeah, yeah. pre-sneeze. I was there taking photos at that thing, funnily enough. So I have photos yeah. of it. Yeah. I was pulling a spoz. How long have you been taking photos? Uh, like one, one, about a month in that window and then I stopped taking photos. We'll do another podcast after he's done 20 years, yes. and um, then I'll be a, a head in a small jar. Excellent. Sort of lit up by LEDs. Well, I'll be a head in a basket, yeah. just for other reasons. We'll just be talking heads. Hell yes. Come see us. And then one with an oversized jacket doing a little dance. That's your celebrity guest, actually. You should get him. Get David Byrne for the, uh, what'll be, 100th We're episode. We're working on it. Yeah, working on it. We have people. We're looking into it. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, so on that first bit of the thing where I said I had a good question for that. Yeah. So, oh, this is a question I did me. answer that eventually, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. So that, that tree one, that was a good one. Actually, yeah. that really did work out. But as, as you have seen many bands, what traits stick out that a band may have 
that would uh, this is this is a tough written question. Basically, yeah, I'm getting you've seen a lot of bands. What traits stick out to you in like new bands or bands that intrigue you? Okay, so you're looking for the uh, memorable traits and bands that would actually survive. Um, I guess the, the quickest way to sort of summarize this into a little sound bite is uh, where you're lacking in talent, compensate in enthusiasm. Hell yes. <laughs> And I mean, we've all done this, and I mean, I'm the living embodiment of this. Um, I have very little talent, but I'm just an explosion of borderline, loudly sarcastic enthusiasm. And when I see that trait on stage, that's usually a good stop. That's usually a good entry point. You just there's this adage: if you play a show and there's only five people in the audience, the worst um, impression you can ever give those five people just go oh, this sucks, and kind of just bum it and just, you know, just just basically play to the floor. If you play that room of five people like it's a fo- room of 5,000, like an absolute maniac, then that is definitely a trait. Hell yeah. So just sheer lunacy. I mean, I think it's... What really works is if the people on stage have no stage fright whatsoever or they do and they just don't care. Yeah, yeah. That works. If That's mad. The thing that always makes me go, ooh, and I kind of want to just shrink away, is when you can tell when they're on stage that they're just sweating bullets. They're just yeah. Going, they're, they're completely they're tr- still and they're yeah, nervous. Yeah. yeah. So, no, just basically just an explosion of idiot energy always helps. Oh, yeah. And then at some point, you know, you develop the talent to back it up. But, yeah, idiot enthusiasm always That's a good works. one. Yeah. Yep. Okay, here's your second question from Lara. Lara from... Um, Funky C and the Genovese, and probably a bunch of other bands too. That one, okay. Yes. Hi, uh, Lara. Have you noticed any recurring trends in Adelaide music? Uh, I need to sort of uh, remember back to which decade because there's a couple of them that came that come up. Um, for a while, there was like every second band in the late two thousands had like a little upright micro corg um, keyboard. Oh, cool. That was going on for too long because everyone wanted to be dance punk. Hell yeah. And then um, I'm just going to break a Dorito here while I'm answering the other uh, question. For a while, there was like every single band was trying to do a, um, a Tash Sultana um, loop pedal thing. Oh, and it was yeah. just everything loop pedals and kind of just the tapping acoustic thing. Damn. It was like, eh. it was everyone trying to be, um, trying to do the little laptop kind of, um, what's that guy of the beard? Um, Who, uh, um, in Adelaide? No, no, the guy with the beard, um, like Sydney-based, something like Fake, something or other. Chet Faker? Chet, Chet Faker. Faker, yeah. Everyone wanted to be him for a while there, and that got um, tedious. There is usually... The, I'm trying to remember what the most recent one is. Actually, I, I probably know a few, but it would probably name and shame a few bands that are exploiting this. But it's always like whatever bands are most likely to fit the... Um, sort of the middle rung of the festival circuit mm. and the Triple J Airplay. There's so many bands that try and do that. Yeah. Not saying there's that many bands in Adelaide that are trying to sound like Ocean Alley, but there may be a few. <laughs> and that's, I think, the latest... Oh, actually, no, the, the, big, the, biggest, um, the biggest thing that um, kills me at the moment, and to be fair, some of them do really well. I think the one band that does it really well is Puree. I'm going to name them because they have... Most of the band have really luscious moustaches. Yes. And I think at the moment that's that's one of the silliest things that I do see in the scene a lot is just the indie band moustache. Yeah, I like those guys. They're pretty cool. Yeah, they have they have a really good, that latest single is really good. So mm. you know, shout out for that. Oh, but, um, yeah, yeah. The indie moustache is a thing. I think musically, yeah, my brain's a bit of a scramble at the moment. I mean, the caffeine is either kicking in or it's waning, and my brain is blue screening trying to think of anything current. Oh, yeah. Actually, ask me the question again. Fuck, I can't even remember. <laughs> Dude, I'm having it the was same weirdly thing, worded, man. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, I think I'm actually just getting distracted by this Dorito too we much. We were just talking it. about puree. No. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just make this entire episode about puree and then get them on next. Yeah, we'll, That's oh, your next guest. And then, like, you like show them yeah. this footage. It's like, how dare you? Yeah. Thanks, boy. guys. Love you. I actually like them. I think they're cool. <laughs> so, no shade. They got cool moustaches. So, yeah, they're, they're the exception to the moustache rule. Um, I'll, I'll get that on record. Well, actually, speaking of like recurring trends, and mm. this is this kind of translates or transfers or whatever that word is to something else. But there's that the footage that you shot of um, Tame Impala, 
And then you were like, no, well, actually, I shot them before this too. Yeah, and then yeah. you, you recently kind of shared the footage of the first time you shot Tame Impala. Yeah, yeah. And there was like this like 1970s band playing, like a themed band playing with them or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And I saw that and I was like... I mean, oh. okay, so <laughs> this is not so much a recent trend. This happens all the time. And it's funny you pick that up because Adelaide does have a really healthy psychedelic scene and it seems to just be kind of revolving around okay you have a bunch of uh, kids whose parents have a decent vinyl collection mm. plus access to a decent um you know saint vinnie's or something yeah hell yeah i think <laughs> this, so every into every generation there is born people who just go op shopping and yeah. somehow base an entire music sound around op shopping and <clears throat> For a while there, it's just it, you just pick whatever the current psychedelic band is to sound like, and there were so many bands about five years ago that tried to sound like uh, King Giz, King like Giz, that was their yeah, big absolutely. reference. The point where the Empty Threats initially were like King Giz is our biggest influence, and I think Stu even borrowed most of their uh, stage presence from that, and they've moved on and become their own sound. But yeah, it was like King Giz, Tame Impala before, and I can't mm. remember it might have been Wolf and Cub before that as the reference or, you know, just King Crimson or something like that. But yeah, the whole op shopping thing has been a constant 70s fashion thing that's been kicking around for a while now. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I think when I first started going out, it was in this window of time where, the, I don't know, I feel like there was like a, a real psych rock thing happening and everybody was trying to be Tame Impala yep. in particular. No, that's, that's not been a new trend. It's just been a undercurrent that's been kicking mm. around for as long as I've been doing it. Currents. Yeah. Always been op shopping psych bands. Hell yes. Op shopping, um, decriminalized marijuana, and yeah, psychedelia. Hell yes. That's the three bullet points that um, sustain the underbelly of the Adelaide scene. Can you get us two XPAs? Two XPAs? Two XPAs. It's two five XPAs. o'clock, guys. Yeah, yeah. And we are sponsored by we need, Carlsberg. We and need Cooper's manufacturers. We Carlsberg need slightly different Adelaide. props. Is that true? Um, yeah, it is true. Fuck. One of these will sustain you. One of these will drain you. Destroy. Honestly, the um, that what Spaz is drinking there, uh, the Sundials are, are sponsored by uh, Barocca Performance. I don't think I've actually drunk any of this. It's it's a pilsner. Um, I don't know. Get get that out Hell of my. Yes. Get that out of my side. It's time to get fucking turned. Yep. Turn. We're doing a. This, this is the famous Spaz episode, so we're getting drunk for it. Yes. Um. Proudly sponsored by the uh, Purple Grape Fun Juice. The Sundials is sponsored by Emil. I just wish, <laughs> I just wish actually that this was the um, the Coopers that does taste like grape juice, and that would just be an interesting experiment. Is that the red me. one? I hate the red one. No, this is the this, is the, this little purple one. The purple purple flavor. Hmm. What yeah. flavor is the Coopers? It's purple flavored. Oh, it's one point five. Oh, that's nice. One point five. Slightly slightly yes. more than a normal one, but they don't yes. taste like fucking piss like yeah, the red ones true. do. Sometimes it's not sponsored by those. I mean, it's like the hang. It's like the hangover you get from an XP. Uh, not from an XPA. Um, the hangover you get from a sparkling. Yeah, oh. Fucking sparklings, dude. Oh, like yeah. those long necks they had at like Super Mild and. It's like elsewhere. somebody got somebody spilt like a bunch of white wine in the beer supply of just normal Coopers. That's what they remind me of. It's like red, white wine plus beer. Dude. I hate it. Yeah, never never drink white wine. It just makes you uh, want to propose marriage to your to your friends, and it's it's not good. Hell yes. Yeah, I feel there's a story there. Maybe, should I press that? Actually? It, it's like the 5 a.m. drunk text, but in real life, that is what white wine does to you. Hell yes. And I'm just getting Doritos over myself. It's like, you'd think that if you handed me a beer, it'd have stopped um, going for the Doritos, and oh, you'd be wrong. They, they combine perfectly. Yeah. Get some yeah. of that sauce in there as well. You remember that episode where Spoz just ate half the props? Yeah. Oh. That was a time. That's what they're there for. They're the people's, people's Doritos. <laughs> have you ever had a Carlsberg Spoz? No. I mean, there we go. This is... Um, We're getting a podcast so, first, guys. Yeah, Here's a debut for you. Uh, the first time I drink Carlsberg. Um, has anyone got triple zero on speed dial? Sure you do. When I'm hanging out with the meal, who knows what's going to happen. Hmm. I heard that from over here, man. <laughs> what the hell? ASMR. This question comes to us from Pods, the Pods, in Toronto. Yeah. Um, how, how does one become spoz and is there a study path? <laughs> well, okay. How do you, how do you become a spoz? Um, 
I think for me, this is sort of a, a formative um, combination of um, elements that brought my flailing being into being. Um, is the combination of being able to hold a camera while incredibly drunk. Hell yes. And actually having the hand-eye coordination, even more so actually taking your best photos while drunk. Hell yes. Is um, a trick to becoming a spoz. It leads into this other silly idea I actually had uh, floating around in my head for a while here, is the uh, issue of secession. Um, if at any point, for whatever reasons, um, accidental petrified accident or you know, botched moon landing or whatever that I'm taking out of the picture, who would replace me and what would that entail? And we had the idea to be kind of like a regenerating Doctor Who kind of situation. Somebody, and it could be any age, any gender, any race, any body composition, as long as it has a... a yeah, as long as you have a black leather jacket and you just walk around with a camera and just say, I'm Spoz. If they're asking, just go, regenerations are weird. And to add a layer into that, I mean, if we're doing this properly, I would name a successor. But the joke is I wouldn't, and you need to have at least five competing spozzes. That's perfect. And it would just be an absolute shambles. You know, like Alexander the Great dies, and then you have all these generals trying to run the empire, and you just have splinter groups, and you just have lots of fake little spozzes. I'm I'm ready for it. The yeah, Adelaide Spoz Civil. So I mean, I think there's a couple of combination of elements. It's being able to take photos whilst horrendously drunk, and more to the point, take your best photos while drunk. Weird angles. The cameras themselves. I'm usually just using. Um, well, let's actually get the Dorito dust off my fingers first. Oh, and scrape it over my. That's all fair. These Doritos were such a mistake, weren't they? Okay, so here's um, an example camera here. Um, it's a Panasonic LX100 uh, Mark II uh, fixed lens micro four thirds. So generally a fixed lens camera is preferred, something good in low light. And um, just being a sarcastic, um, mischief-prone, flailing idiot. The, the components that lead into... I'm going to leave those Doritos alone. Actually, get some more beer. They're probably the, the components that lead to forming a spoz. I think I answered that question. I'm notorious for just neandering for 20 minutes and never actually remembering what the question was. So I'm glad it came to a conclusion there. Excellent. Well, look, I don't know. That's kind of what this podcast is. This will be is. a three-hour podcast. Hell yes. Like, I'll set some snack breaks like we're doing here. Have some snacks when you're watching this podcast, because we're going to be here a while. So, yeah, so what convinced you to start the blog then? And was it just words at first, and then became a photo thing? Well, okay, so the blog is 20 years old, so it's gone through a lot of sort of uh, shifting iterations. Um, the original name, and wow, I regret calling it this now, the name Spoz's Rant was originally, the best way to sort of make it more succinct as an answer for the origin of that is imagine a world before Twitter existed but needing something kind of like Twitter when you know you just have a stupid idea in your head and you just want to say it and you want as big an audience to see it as possible that's what Spoz's rant was it was like oh, I have a silly joke I got really hammered and I came up with a band name and that started the blog and I've completely forgotten the question now <laughs> <laughs> so basically you, you invented Twitter yeah, I mean, at least Twitter has a 140 character limit. So, it, um, yeah, it, it started with me just rambling, just off-the-cuff nonsense, but very quickly got co-opted because I had friends in the music scene, even back then, because, you know, everyone has a friend who has a friend who has a band. So within the first week, I did my first written review, and it was a shambles. I think I just mentioned what was on the, uh, on the dinner menu at uh, the Prince Albert Hotel where the uh, first gig I actually wrote about. And then, you know, sort of a couple of months after that, I finally got a camera and then I took photos of it. And I've completely forgotten the question. I'm just freeballing here. I can't even remember. Something about, something about where you're, where this whole thing started. Like where okay, you... okay. So um, the, the main issue I had when I was starting out, um, this was maybe a couple of years into uh, pokies being introduced into all the Adelaide yeah, venues okay. and kind of just screwing everything up. Like, um, 
back, this was in the late nineties they introduced them all, and there used to be just a stack of suburban venues. There was the Holdy in Glenelg, there was the Royal in Kent Town, and there was all these venues that you used to do as a circuit. And when they were all drying up, and this was, you know, in my um in a certain period of my life, I won't say what what age I was twenty years ago, I was three. Um <laughs> There, there was that period, you know, when everyone just starts settling down and starts quitting bands and they all just start playing acoustic. Mm. So it was a combination of all the pokies coming in, the, the music scene drying up, and it just felt like all you were seeing was acoustic gigs. And I went, crap, I've got to document this before it all disappears. I, yeah. I, I thought it was like an endangered species. It, it felt sort of apocalyptic. And a lot of the early years of the blog was kind of like just trying to preserve all this history before it disappeared. That's awesome. And I mean, it never did. It, it kept coming back. I think the lowest point when it sort of really dipped down was maybe in the late 2000s. There was like a winter in 2009 where I made a, a bit of a running joke that I was just concocting the entire scene, music scene with like finger puppets because <laughs> it had dried up completely. So yeah, there was a scramble just to document everything. That was the drive. And also just, I mean, when you reach a certain age, you feel if you're not contributing some meaningful aspect to the music scene, then you're just some weirdo who goes to gigs. Mm. So I feel like I wanted to contribute something, to, to be an actual presence of worth and measure. And That's awesome. That, that literally was one of the questions I had for you was like, because I guess the Sundial's Facebook page is in a group that's called, like, I went off on the Adelaide local music scene in, like, the late 80s, early 90s, before oh, Pokies. Oh, I've seen this Facebook yeah. group. And so Shout been, out to the people who run it. Yeah, but I've been seeing photos God. from back then. And I wonder, like, do you think we are in a golden age or a dark age of music? Uh, I'd say uh, we definitely bounce back into a bit of a golden age. Um I'll reference the Facebook group. I don't know if they're nearly as active or because of the algorithm, I don't see their posts anymore. Yeah, like the music scene went off in the 80s and 90s. And there is a problem where the, the, the minute you stop engaging with the music scene, you just think your days were the glory yeah, days. And it's yeah, all crap absolutely. now. You'll get in so many... Um, if you're, if you're um, a member of any or many uh, sizable music groups, there would be... They're always musicians, late middle age, and they're just griping, going, "Yeah, man, it used to be so good in the eighties, mate. Yeah. yeah, in the nineties, used to be used to get like hundreds of dollars just playing gig after gig. Crowds would be awesome, and now it sucks. And they've just really the problem with the music scene in general is not that it's ever in a dark age." is if you lose touch with the network of people who kind of keep you looped in to where all the good stuff is. And all the venues keep shifting around. So it was definitely just just pre-COVID. In 2019, it was really starting to upswell and there was a serious momentum happening. And then COVID killed it. Yeah. And I think, I mean, reassuringly, it's definitely bouncing back. And I've got to give them credit... Um, most of the upswell, I think COVID killed off a lot of uh, bands that are sort of in the early to mid 20s. It kind of cleaned them out because I think, oh, yeah, we can finally, we finally got the momentum to actually make a career out of this. And then just everything dropped. So they all kind of disappeared. There's a couple sprinkled around that were kind of reasonably established who were kicking on. But the real upswell of the scene now, and I reckon a few years when you get a few more singles, EPs, um, debut albums out of it, is. And I say this with love and with appreciation. All the all the really shitty little eighteen year old bands who play broadcast and Arthur's hell yeah are incredible. It's yeah. just a, I mean the fact that all those all those gigs pack out and it's just a cloud of vape smoke everywhere. Yeah, and it's just grimy. It's stupid. It's loud and it's perfect. And that I mean already if you go to one of those gigs, it's just vibey as fuck. But on the other hand, you give that at maybe about oh, two years, three years or so, when they have like singles and EPs and established kind of touring vibes as well, that is going to be a serious scene. I do say that with a bit of an asterisk to it because um, into every generation, there's this idea of, oh yeah, things are just starting to get good. <laughs> there was this, um, there's this documentary, I think it was... Um, 
and I could name any number of de- documentaries. Could be any sort of decade from the late nineties is the one I'm citing. But there would be documentaries like this from the late two thousands, uh, the late twenty uh, tens, and they'd always be interviewing people on radio or everything, going, "Yeah, man, it's just starting to get good." And I saw that from something back in the late nineties, um, and this was just before a whole bunch of record labels in Adelaide just folded. <laughs> And it's always this kind of thing where you think like, oh, it's upswelling and then it disappears and then it upswells. But yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. I mean, you don't know it's good when it's good and you miss it when it's not. Yeah. So when you see it enough times, you try to appreciate when it is humming. And I think it's definitely on its upswell now. I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's uh, really growing well. That's cool. Yeah, that's interesting. And I got to thank just all the little, I mean, the best shout out I can give is Looch. You're a bunch of little shits and I love you. That vibe, that vibe is, yeah, just messy, messy, thrashy, silly live gig vibes are a great, like, foundation for a music scene. Awesome. That's awesome. That was very profound, I suppose. I like it. Yeah. I've I've been around for a while. I'm the oldest guest so far. I'm a million years old. Yeah, he's uh I get um frequent blood transfusions from young acolytes that keep me fresh and vibrant. Yes, well he's actually in his seventies. Mm. But that's awesome, man. That's cool to hear. That's... I am Ned Flanders. I'm like Ned nothing Taylor. at all. <laughs> yeah, look, that's that's we'll really that cool. To that's, hear. A, that's a weird reference. No, that's good. Does that's anyone good. know the Simpsons anymore? No, I mean... nobody nobody under the age of thirty eight knows about the Simpsons anymore. There are people born now of drinking age who are on the scene who don't remember when The Simpsons was good. Dude, my thing is that there's people on the scene now that don't know about 9-11. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't see 9-11. That's like, what? But yeah, I don't know, man. That's good. I, I, I kind of want to have a pause and think about that. Cool yeah, just... Um, the golden age and shit. Ha- have some Doritos while you think it over. Hell yes. Look at this. A moment of silence for the victims of 9-11. And, and Doritos. But yeah, no, that's fucking mad, man. That's I've I've always thought about that because it is cool to see those bands. Even the other weekend when um, what was that 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 cool ass punk band that was playing at the Crown Anchor? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, it's oh, we'll give another shout out to uh, Pete the Stud Howlett. The the band in question was I think it was actually a reunion. I never saw him back in the day, but it was a reunion for a band called the Blood Sucking Freaks, mm. and. It's become almost cliche now that you walk in after a, a show at the uh, the Cranker and there's just there's just a fine coat of broken glass on the floor, but there was an extra, extra crunch of, of broken glass that night. Yeah, it was like sand. It's like near the beach. And I mean, the best way if you if you if you need a good bit of advice when it comes to um, watching some of the older people's music, definitely if you get even a a, a, a hint that Pete Howlett is going to be fronting a show, go see it. Uh, the best way to describe his, um, and he use the term loosely, guitar playing style is um, whether you're referencing the 70s original or the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre where Leatherface is just doing this crazy wild swing of the chainsaw, that's him playing guitar or more correctly forgetting how a guitar works and he's just playing it back behind his head, somehow still strumming it, chewing the, uh, yeah. the strings... And he's just a madman. I saw, yeah, he was playing solos. His and that gives you that really gives you hope that um, the worst feeling you can ever get is when bands progress to the point where they kind of just check out, and they're just uh, weekend warriors, and they they got their nine to five jobs, and they're just doing the rounds. But when you see people of a certain, I would say Tim Rogers level of vintage, just being the maddest idiots, and they're in their fifties, that is inspiring. Hmm. Fuck yeah. Because it's, I mean, you, you don't want to be trapped in the idea that live music is just an age thing that you drop out on, sort of after around about 22 to 25. Because that's when you finally actually develop some talent to cover for the enthusiasm, you know. That's a good point. Okay, so I guess on, you talked about like 2008, 2009 being like a worst moment for Adelaide music. I mean, we didn't really know at the time. I mean,. <clears throat> There was still a lot of silliness going on. And I mean, that was also about the time period where I shot those two Tame Impala yeah, videos yeah. that everyone keeps citing. It's like, man, you shot Tame Impala back in 2009 and you're still doing it. Yeah. No, it's I, cool. I think actually, um, I know I've mentioned that joke in, in passing of a lot of people because it was just a hilarious moment. I think it was, who's the lead singer from No Lemon? 
Is it uh, Liam? Liam Garvey. Yeah, I think he was the original uh, cat who told me that. And uh, shout out to that cat out there. That was that was a wild moment. It's like, man, you shot Tame and Pilot, and you're still doing that sucks, it. man. <laughs> yeah, and that that made me that instantly made me feel like Gandalf. I think that's where I came up with the joke that I'm Adelaide scenes uh, Gandalf the Grey. Hell yeah, man. Because I heard that and was like, whoa, yeah, I've really been sucks, around man. an age. Yeah, well, he he's one of those nine eleven. I was there three thousand years ago. Yeah, man. When the age of men faltered. Yeah, far out. Well, look, so uh, you talked about that then. Um, do you have any, like, particular highlights from, like, 20 years of doing it? Like, meeting perhaps certain people or things like that Tammy Pilot which everyone talks about and all that stuff. Do you have any, like, particular golden moments? I mean, thankfully, I, I did kind of... Uh, I assumed this question was going to come, and if you just asked me cold, I would have just blue screened and forgot about it. Um, there's a few silly moments um one where there was this uh i don't know if they're new york based they're definitely u.s based there is this band called harma superstar and i think in the year since the lead singer got maybe indicted for something but and when i described the show you could probably understand why he was kind of this um heavy set really didn't look after himself kind of balding crazy man and during the show, he would just uh, shed clothes until it was just him and his underpants, just pulling like Michelangelo's David, but in a really unfit way on stage. And what made this extra crazy is the gig happened on Good Friday, but just after midnight at Producers. And the backing band, I think, was uh, one of the members of the Distillers and the drummer from The Strokes. Wow. And... If you, I mean, I've never actually seen the strokes, but I've definitely seen the drama. And this was back when it was still legal to smoke indoors. And he just had this cigarette hanging out of his mouth and just casually just drummed out while this extremely unfit, flailing idiot out front would just be, you know, gyrating around his underpants and just freaking the crowd out. That's that was definitely uh, something memorable. There was also, just on a slightly more uh, civilized level, there were a series of gigs that happened in sort of uh, 2012, 2013 called Moving Music. And the concept was you would buy a ticket and you'd meet up at a nondescript, nondescript uh, car park somewhere in the city. And then the tour guide sort of dressed like sort of a 19th century explorer with a little goofy hat and a safari suit would sort of convene the crowd and then walk you to the first location, which will just be behind some building where a stage would be set up and maybe a bit of set dressings, like sort of scattered newspapers or cardboard boxes. And the first band would play in sort of in the back alley. And then as a group, you would wander to the next band in sort of some random park somewhere, and then another band, then another band, and you might finish at Car Clue. And there was a series of those in like 2012, 2013. They were wild. Mad. Just wandering through the cities from location to location kind of gigs. And I think it just wound up, um, they did a final installment uh, somewhere up in the hills. Cool. And that was freaky. That's and awesome. I mean, there's also gigs I could never remember that it's all like rooftop shows and random stuff like that. That's mad. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the, the whole Spodsfest thing that happened? <laughs> that was cool. Okay. So you're, you're, I'm assuming you're referencing the whole uh, Febby thing. Mm. I mean... Even when I try to explain it to myself, that doesn't really make sense. Um, so to give a little bit of context, because I got talking to the people who run the and it kind of makes sense. Uh, any other time of year, there are a bunch of people who just have this theatre and they'll be in the office and the phone would ring. It'll be like Frontier Touring going, hey man, we're blah, blah, blah of this band. Um, can we... Um, you know, schedule this as part of our tour date. You go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we've got a free little spot, here you go. And this would be like pre-COVID, touring bands, uh, touring production companies, and they'll just fill their schedule to the brim. Normal times, sweet as, then COVID happens, and then their entire roster disappears. And so they needed to kind of drum up a bit of atmosphere, a bit of hype, and a bit of, hey, we still exist and we're still out there. And more importantly, they had a crap ton of government funding to back them. And they wanted to do a local show. And what made it um, funnier still is to find out who could possibly do this show for, for us. They 
they did a random Google and they they found um, an article that was written about me when I'd done 10 years non-stop every weekend blogging. So every week, every weekend without fail, we'll be out there with a camera just taking photos. And they found the article about it. And long story short, I kept that going for at least 13 and a bit years before COVID killed it and I was out of action for a couple of months like everyone else. But yeah, so they, I woke up one day and there was this message on my Facebook page saying, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah from Thebby. Do you want to do a show of us? And I'm like, what? That's mad. Because, I mean, to put it into context, I mean, I realized later on when I'd actually done the thing that, okay, this kind of made sense why they got me. But I did tell them while I was doing this, it's like, you do realize I'd never actually booked a show before. And then they got me to do a festival at Thebby. That's so cool. And I mean... Yeah, the only show I did before then was maybe about two bands at World's End. Like, it's now West Oak. Like, back in the day, I did that. And then I went from that to booking. It was like, it was five nights originally. There was going to be a hip-hop um, night, which didn't really um, get as much hype as we hoped, so we had to cancel that one. But it was four shows. And it was headlined um, Empty Threats one night, uh, Nocturnal Animals the other night, um... Sons of Zoku, Dirty Pagans, and then we had a sort of a rock, paper, scissors night with uh, Stabber from the Knifey Wifeys, Bitch Spawn, Hey Harriet, and Seabass. That's it. I remembered all four bands. But yeah, that was a trip. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I could go into a whole bunch of stories that the, um, that the owners of Thebby had. The best way to explain it without incriminating too many people is Thebi a very much a multi-generational in the family kind of setup. And the best way to succinctly explain it, if your dad is a guy who runs Thebi and you're a kid into music and you imagine what personality, what upbringing that brings, that's the guy who got me in to do the shows. So cool. he was a character. He had stories of these wild, wild shows he used to go to back in the day. Mm. So he was dyed in the wall music scene kind of character. So we got along like a like a house on fire. It was great. Like they're excellent crew at Thebby. But it was mad they got me in. Like I, it's still surreal walking into that room going, uh, I am doing a show here tonight. Yeah, I got a video of you doing a speech. I think it was on yeah. the first night. Yeah, I mean, that was actually a little bit reassuring because I've realized one handy thing about being an idiot wisecracking and heckling a band with a camera in front of a stage if you do that for enough number of years where you're just heckling the band on stage and you're in front of the stage that being on stage doesn't matter mm. no stage fright it doesn't matter which was really tested when they're like hey man do you want to just introduce the final band of the night at Thebby so it was that brief moment where I'm walking on stage at Thebby going surely this is going to be the moment where the stage fright kicks in and no, it was fun. That's cool. Which was weird. Yeah. That was a seated show, I think, where, like, for the most part it was, I think. Well, I mean... Because I remember sitting down for that one. Yeah, no, it was It was that weird... It was COVID rules always yeah. kind of flip-flopping. I mean, that whole period of time was such a bizarre sandwich. I don't have Dorito dust on me. I'm just checking. Quick break. Oh, we're just doing a quick break. All right, guys, wait. Is the camera still rolling? Yeah. Okay, watch this. <laughs> and we're back. And we're back. I've just inherited I am, in fact, Spoz now. The space-time continuum has been restored. I've got my chip. I've got a camera over here. It all works out. Well, look, I think at this point in time, to round off the... I'm a dream pop band. The full clean hour of podcasting. Is there anything else, any other stories you like to tell, Spoz? I mean, I, if you just ask me a blank question like that, I'm going to blue screen. Give me, give me something specific I can kind of pounce on here. All right, we're going to go to the audience for, for uh, questions. Have you got anything, Emil? What do you think? A question for Spoz? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> Are you blue screening right now? Okay. Can you shoot the Dainty Morsels, Sundials and Badland Caravan at Arthur Art Bar? Can I shoot? Can you? Well, When? Whenever. <laughs> I think he's done that before, honestly. Is it physically possible for me to do that? To shoot those bands again? I mean, I could, but I could also do what I did one week. So I might have mentioned that thing where I did uh, every week for 13 and a bit years. Before that, uh, there was one particular week. This, this will make sense in a, in a bit, wondering where the segues to. 
So there was this one week where I couldn't go out and do the blog because I had the flu. And the reason I might have had the flu, it was the week after big day out and it was predictably a 45 degree day at the big day out. And I walked all the way from there to the cranker in 45 degree heat, caught up with some Melbourne band called Jika, who could only really be succinctly described as a Mexican-Hungarian techno metal band with bongos. <laughs> I mean, that, that just sounds insane coming out of my head. And they challenged me to round after round of absinthe shots. And then the week after I had the flu. And I figured I needed to fill in this little um, gap in the, uh, in, the, um, in the continuum. So I invented an episode. And I made it increasingly obvious that I invented it by the end. I think I used a couple of photos of like the, the band out of Star Wars uh, cantina scene. With the boop, 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 yeah. Them and um, maybe George Michael for Wham! to finish it. But yeah, I managed to, for every single venue I was going to go to... I managed to have enough photos in the archive to kind of just stitch it together. It's like, oh, yeah. this band playing this venue, I can do that. So, what, Dandies, uh, Dainties, Sundials, Badland. I have so much footage at Arthur's that I haven't used in the blog. I could probably just invent an entire episode All right. of that. <laughs> we'll hold you to And it'll probably be about as lively. Yeah. Hell yeah. Right on. Okay. Well, is there anything else? You got any party? You got anything else? What's the band you've shot the most? So, um, every year is always a different one. And I'm not sure what this year's is going to be yet. I know I've shot Mum's Favourite a lot. Mm. But at this running joke, um, I used to for a brief period, and I'm thankful that Music Essay finally took over running this instead. I used to have a uh, Spoz's Rant Awards every year and one of the categories was this called the Mona Lisa Overdrive Award because back in 2008 Mona Lisa Overdrive were that one band that just played every damn week and they would be supporting ba the kind of good bands you want to see to such a point that you couldn't avoid them and I will say this it's actually a really good strategy if you want to do if you want to see what band really does well is you spot that one play band that just plays every weekend. I mean, Teenage Jones did it back in 2019. Mm. They just played every week. I think it got to the point where they were playing maybe... It was one particular week where they did four shows in a week, and it was crazy. So them, definitely in 2019, it was uh, Teenage Jones. I think in 2020, it might have been Pelvis, and I lost track of it for 21 and 22. But yeah, I think at the moment, it's Mum's favourite I've done the most. Cool. So far this year. And they're... Excellent band. So, what is it? Yeah, what, what have you got? They are a great band. Yes. Shout out, most favorite. Yeah. Can you tell us about DJ Spoz? <laughs> DJ Spoz. Um, okay. So, what aspect are you talking about? My uh, my very short lived uh, two month Tuesday night residency at the Ed Castle, or the actual? Uh, <clears throat> don't look up Spoz on Bandcamp, or do, because there is some stuff up there. Tell us about it. Okay, so um, I can say that photography wasn't the only art I've ever done in my entire life. It's actually just been the last of a series of um, creative misadventures, and I may need some Barocca to wash out the uh, Doritos while I say this. Excuse me, a bit of more ASMR. <laughs> so yeah, um, I started off creatively as an illustrator doing a lot of uh, ridiculous drawings and nonsense stuff like that. Did visual arts um, at UniSA. And if anyone does enough of a university course on the arts, you just lose all motivation and spirit to keep doing that. So I jumped from doing visual arts straight into being a gleefully terrible laptop techno act. Hell yes. Um, influences, key influences were The Prodigy, Aphex Twin... Bit of Nine Inch Nails, bit of Left Field, Chemical Brothers, uh, Ronnie Size represent, you know, drum and bass, IDM, crunchy break beats. I was actually reasonably good as a producer, kind of terrible live. Uh, it was just me, a literally just a fold out card table and a laptop. And then I got um, an MC at the front who, I don't know if you, oh, 
you probably would be familiar. Uh, the dude who does Borat, but before he did Borat, he did Ali G. Mm. Yeah. Like the hip-hop guy. My MC just looked like that guy. So it was this, it was this weird combination where I really did not want to do hip-hop and this dude was just the biggest hip-hop graph head. I mean, he's still my Facebook friends and he's still doing these mad kind of graffiti pieces around town. You know, like legitimate stuff where you get the full mural and he's big into Star Wars. I won't, I won't give him a shout out by name because I don't want to encourage him too much. Mm-hmm. Hi, if you're tuning in. Um, so we had this weird dynamic where he was really into hip hop and I really wasn't into hip hop. And I was, and still am, a bit of a mischievous shit. So it's like, how can I just kind of drive him insane? And so I um, quite often just got him to scream like a punk idiot on songs and they were our best songs. So yeah, we have this somewhere very much hidden in plain sight on the internet. I have four anthology EP, uh, LP uh, releases and a remix album of wow. uh, my music. DJ Squaws. It's out there. It's hidden so much in plain sight that if you go to the blog itself and you see a Bandcamp link up top, don't click that link. Don't click it. <laughs> don't, don't click it. Don't don't take the temptation or download everything for free. Just don't. Do, but don't. Hmm. Okay. Well, in that case, we've been talking to Spoz for one hour. One hour. And we have some friends. One hour of two. Yes, we're one hour of four in now. And we have some friends waiting in the wings, ready to... Uh, I don't know how I want to introduce them because they've got a new song coming out in a few days that will already have been out by the time this thing comes out. But we have them live tonight for the first time ever on the Sundials podcast. We have a live band ready to play us out. Uh, the Sundials and Spoz, actually the two Spozers would like to... Uh, what, what's the word? The Sundials and the two, two Spozers would like to... We'd like, like to... combine forces like Voltron and bring you...